Good morning, this is Tim Dudley and I'm coming to you again from Abe 93.7 and I'm so glad that you're listening in this morning. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for tuning in this morning. As you know, today is Easter Sunday, but I'm probably going to refer to it for the rest of this broadcast as Resurrection Sunday because I don't want us to lose focus on what today actually is. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is undoubtedly the most important day in the history of the entire universe. Without today, we would be a world that is lost and without hope, spiritually dead in our sins and not able to eternally commune with the Father. I hope that this message finds you well and that you are given great peace in knowing that we serve a Jesus that is in effect alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. Before I begin this uh, message this morning, I want to take a moment to go before the Lord in prayer. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing me to live in a country that I can freely praise your name and celebrate this Resurrection Sunday without any fear of persecution. My family won't be affected, my job won't be affected, or anything else like that won't be affected because I live in this freedom in America. I am so humbled that you loved us, loved us so much that you chose to die for me and the people that I love on that cross. When I think about all the ways in which I have failed you, I am astounded that you still made the ultimate sacrifice, knowing ahead of time that I would fail you. Thank you that your love for me never ceases, even when I'm hardest to love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to read to you this morning uh, the resurrection passage that's in Matthew. Uh, But before that, I kind of want to back up a little bit and give you a little historical background or or the events leading up to it. So if you remember, I talked a little bit about last week. Uh, this past week was Passion Week, and it started with Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday, as we celebrated anyway on our calendar. And those these were the events that lead, led up to the crucifixion on Good Friday. So you have Palm Sunday where Jesus and the disciples are coming into Jerusalem. It's a triumphant entry. Everybody is excited, and they're yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And it's a... Uh, a time of celebration, a time of rejoicing. The people that have been following Jesus think that this is Jesus, this is the King that is coming to save the Jewish people from the tyranny at the time. They thought it was the the King that was going to save the Jewish people from the tyranny of the Romans. So in, in throughout Jewish history, it was always uh, the Messiah was going to save from whatever oppressor they were under at the time. But... Uh, this this was a culminating thing. They had seen Jesus, the in the latest major miracle that he did is he raised Lazarus from the dead, um, and then he's coming into Jerusalem. And so everybody's expecting the triumphant entry, Hosanna to the King. They're shouting and they're they're ex- explaining, and we call it Palm Sunday because they were taking their coats and they were taking palms and they were laying them on the road, and that way the donkey that uh, Jesus was riding on into Jerusalem on that road would not have to step on the dirt or on the rocks or anything like that. They cared so much about his entry into Jerusalem that they even covered the road. A few short days later, Jesus is having the Last Supper with the disciples, kind of moving the timeline forward so you kind of understand the, how the events happened. He has the Lord's Supper, uh, the Last Supper, the Last Communion, whatever you want to refer to it as, with the disciples. Judas leaves, and he goes to the Sanhedrin, and he explains to them where they can find Jesus later. And then they do find Jesus later in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying is really where you see the first time that Jesus is really understanding the weight of what's getting ready to happen. Or maybe not understanding, but we get to see them, him express the weight of what is going to happen in the uh, crucifixion. You hear something that's kind of different that you don't normally hear in the rest of the Gospels or the rest of the, the stories that involve Jesus, especially when he's praying. He prays and he prays and he prays to the Father, take Lord, take this cup from me, and he says a few other things, but you hear silence. You don't hear a response from God. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards Uh, kind of explain this time as the first real time where Jesus is kind of apart from the Father, where uh, he's understanding the weight of what he's getting ready to go through. because And it it starts here at the Garden of Gethsemane. And that you see that illustrated through the Gospels and and, and specifically where we hear about Jesus uh, sweating drops of blood and, and there is such passion and 
heaviness on Jesus that these blood blood capillaries and things like that are bursting in his skin and this is actually a medical condition where we uh, uh, doctors have proven today that it's possible and such agony and we understand now really what eternity apart from the father looks like and that's what it that's that's agony that's sweating these drops of blood that's the separation from the father that jesus experienced remember he had this com- constant communion with his father his whole life up until the remember jesus was a hundred percent god and a hundred percent man and up until this point he never experienced this in the moment that he experienced this emptiness and this lack of communion with the father is when you get to see him sweating these drops of blood and it's a very agonizing experience well moving forward a little bit after this uh they're in the Garden of Gethsemane. The people come and they arrest him. And they bring him to trial at night in a time where it's not even a legal uh, uh, legal gathering or a, a, a legal court proceeding. And it's kind of done under the cover of darkness. And a lot of things happen after this. And it ends up on the hill on Golgotha where Jesus is crucified. And it, but this isn't a Good Friday message. This is a Resurrection Sunday message because everything in Christianity hinges on today, on Resurrection Sunday. And so I just wanted to give you a little bit of backstory of what happened leading up to where we're at now in Matthew 28. So Matthew 28, 1 through 6 says, Now after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you have come to seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said, come see the place where he lay. This is incredible news and we're going to talk in talk a little bit uh later on a little bit what this means for us as christians today what it means for the rest of the world and the hope that they can have in jesus in the resurrected jesus that is alive and well today reigning and ruling and sitting on the right hand of the father but for the skeptics out there i want to just kind of talk to you guys a little bit about some historical stuff that has taken place that might kind of put uh, a different view and a different spin and a different uh, thought process of yes the resurrection did actually happen there we can look at some things that happened historically some of its extra biblical text or extra bu- biblical knowledge that is outside of the bible things that have been recorded throughout history that are interesting and and you can and i hope that you dig into this deeper outside of this message and really kind of do some research on it because there is a staggering amount of evidence that shows that Jesus was a real person, Jesus was really crucified, and that Jesus really uh, was resurrected and ascended to the Father. Um, let's start with some mathematical proof. So you can go on the website. It's all one word, according to the scriptures.org. And on this website, according to the scriptures.org, you can find about 356 prophecies in the Old Testament that f- were fulfilled by Jesus' life. So everything about Jesus' ministry, including the virgin birth, his ministry, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Uh, Most of these prophecies in the Old Testament were recorded more than 700 years before Jesus' birth. This is a phenomenon. So the statistical probability of this happening is absolutely astronomical. Uh, For instance, so if Jesus had fulfilled only 48 of the prophecies, it would be equivalent to 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Now, I'm not a math guy. I'm not like super uh, whiz guy as far as that sort of thing. But basically, if you put 1 in 10, so like put the 10, and then you add 157 zeros. So 1 in 10 plus 157 zeros, that's the odds of just 48 of the prophecies coming true from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But the fact is, it wasn't 48 prophecies only. As a matter of fact, it was 356 prophecies that can be traced from the Old Testament that were fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, Apart from God having his hand in this, 
All 356 prophecies being fulfilled is a mathematical impossibility. This is not something that is even possible in, in our scope of understanding, and it would have to be something to the uh, some sort of higher power. We believe it's God, and that we believe that Jesus it was God uh, incarnate here on earth. Uh, so that's just a little bit of mathematical proof that is, to me, I always find very staggering and how it lined up. And you may think, well, yeah, it's, it's the Bible. They're all just uh, writing to, to make it so everybody understands it and they're trying to prove themselves right in how they write the Bible. But you have to understand that there's like over 40 authors and it was written in three different languages and it took like 1,500 years to write the Bible. If you've ever played the game Telephone, you know how difficult it is to keep such a consistent message. This was... Uh, we're talking about the Bible that's breathed out by God, 2 Timothy 3.16. And so it's it's not something that we can just take lightly and say, yeah, they just kind of concocted and, and lined up all these prophecies to be true. This, there would have to be so much uh, collusion going on and back in these days across continents people were writing this. People weren't even talking to one another when they were writing this. They weren't even located in the same area when they were writing these things. So it's really just an impossibility for that to be the case. Uh, there's also some historical proof. Let's move to historical proof real quick. It's, there are well-documented facts that were recorded in both Greek and Roman and other literature of the time that show this to be true. So the facts are uh, – this, these, these facts don't come from the Bible, right? So there are facts that Jesus was a real person. There are facts out there that Jesus did, in fact, die by crucifixion. There are facts that very soon after his death – his followers had experiences that there were actual appearances of the risen Jesus. And we'll talk about that, uh, how it pertains in the Bible here in a minute. Um, here, here's a great fact here. Their lives were transformed, and as a result, even to the point of being willing to die specifically for their faith in the resurrection message, they held to it. Um, what I mean by that is there were so many people that saw Jesus that they were willing to die when they were questioned about the resurrection. Now, if people are dying in, in line and you know that people are dying ahead of you, you have the opportunity then to say, no, I don't know if Jesus was resurrected or not. But the fact that they saw him physically and bodily resurrected and alive proves that, that goes to show that they were willing to die for something that they saw. Not something that they heard or thought maybe that's a neat idea or something that they hoped in or anything like that. They literally saw Jesus. And because they saw Jesus, they were okay, and they knew that they had the hope of eternal life. They knew that, that because of that, that they were willing to die and, and not uh, cover the fact that there was a resurrection. James, even Jesus' unbelieving brother, became a Christian due to his own experience when he saw the resurrected Christ. Uh, the Christian persecutor Saul, he became Paul on the road to Damascus after uh, – Becoming a believer after seeing Christ. And we'll see that actually in scripture here later. Uh, so right there you see some historical proof that's really, really hard to deny. And these are all things that some of them are in the Bible, but they're also recorded extra biblically. And history has shown these things to be true facts and, and recorded by people that don't necessarily prescribe to Christianity, which is an important thing to understand. Dr. Wellam, who is a professor of Christian theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, explains this about the resurrection. The evidence for the resurrection is well known, and it consists of three interlocking pieces. One, the fact of the empty tomb, and again, that's recorded not just in the, in the Bible. Two, the resurrection and appearances of Christ. And three, the transformation of the disciples and the establishment of the church. This data is interlocking since one piece of the data without the others would not provide a good case. Now, let's talk very briefly about the transformation of the disciples. We understand in the Gospels that Peter, when Jesus was arrested, became very, very afraid to even uh, confess that he knew Jesus. He actually denied him three times, which was prophesied by Jesus, and he denied him three times before the rooster crowed. Well, after he saw the resurrected body of Jesus, he became bold, and he became on fire for God, and he went out, and he preached, and people were saved, and, and he was even arrested, and he was even beaten and whipped, and after he was beaten and whipped, he was excited because he could bear the marks of Jesus on his back, and so 
you see a complete transformation because his faith was just skyrocketed because he was able even at one point before Jesus' death to deny him and then after his resurrection and he saw him physically he just became an evangelist on fire for God and he didn't care if he was killed and extra biblical text talks about the history of that that Peter was actually crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be uh, killed in the same way that Jesus was killed so there is uh, a lot of extra biblical justification and facts that are uh, uh, they're supporting the resurrection of Jesus the Bible itself gives a uh, several uh, proofs as well. I just didn't want to start there because people might think that's kind of circular logic, like you're proving the Bible using the Bible. But I want to do I do want to share some uh, biblical truths from with you uh, that surround the resurrection. So Acts one three says that he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So this wasn't a, 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 a one-time singular event, like he shows himself to the disciples and then boom, he's gone. Okay, He is hanging around for 40 days. I don't know how many people, now think about, and you may not know the, the demographics and, and the culture and stuff like that, uh, but the, where they're at, in Jerusalem is a very, very populated and it's a busy area, busy place. Uh, if you're there for 40 days, people are going to see you. You're going to be noticed. People speak word of mouth. There's not telecommunications or internet or anything like today. People are going to know you're there and they're going to know very quickly you're there. And he was there for 40 days. Uh, another supporting uh, passage for that is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Uh, and this is uh, written by Paul. And he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. He's talking about when he wrote it. And then some of them have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to the untimely born. He appeared also to me. Again, this is Paul talking. And then he concludes that passage with the time that he met him. And he, and he went from became Saul to Paul whenever he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But 500 people at one time. He, he even says in order that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then, then to the twelve. And then he, 500 brothers at a time, and then to James, and then to the apostles, and then to him lastly, uh, from his account. There's a lot of people there. There's a lot of people that have seen Jesus and that it's very hard to say that he has not seen them. Uh, what does that mean to us? That means a lot to us, really. So, uh, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, so, Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise took partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of de over death, that is the devil, and deliver all those through the fear of death that were subject to lifelong slavery. Now what kind of slavery are we talking about? We're talking about the slavery of sin and the uh, punishment for sin, which is death. God has taken that blame, that sin, through Jesus on the cross for our sins, for our shame, for our potential uh, eternal death and, and our damnation in hell. And Jesus has made a way for that. We, we can't take that lightly, guys. We need to understand John 14, 6 that says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through Him. And it's important that we understand that and we believe that and we hold on to that truth. And it's important that we talk to other people about that. And I don't want to undercut the importance of that. My time is running out with you this morning, but I want you guys just to know and understand that is vital and that is so important. And I don't, I, if you don't know Jesus today, I want, I just urge you to please email me at jesusloveyou860 at gmail.com.
Today is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Don't go another day without emailing me at jesuslovesyou860 at gmail.com. I want to get to, I want to get to the chance to pray with you, to explain more to you about Jesus, and to share his great love for you and the plan that he has for your life, because it's very important that, uh, you know and understand that. I unfortunately have run out of time this morning. I'm sorry, there's a whole lot I wanted to say to you this morning, and maybe we'll cover some next week. But God bless you and have a wonderful week.